Good morning again, and welcome to Mount Zion Baptist Church on the day of our Lord. Whoops, get that off of there. Now it doesn't look like I have a black speck in my face, you know. On that video, that's what happens if I leave that up there. So, if you got your Bibles this morning, turn to Acts. We'll start in the uh, fifth or I take it back. Fifth chapter, fifth chapter of Acts this morning, if you would. Um, actually, I'm going to read a verse from chapter four, so, and then we'll go to Acts chapter five. I want to talk to you this morning, just a minute or two, about hypocrisy or being a hypocrite. And uh, Wednesday night, we had a good, good time here, and we had a good kind of a group discussion, I guess. We didn't really, I didn't really preach. We just talked a lot about an old-fashioned Christian, an old-fashioned Christian. And we got to talking, and we realized that in today's society, in today's day, it's hard to find an old-fashioned Christian. It's hard to find one that is described in the Bible as a Christian, as to what a Christian is. We have a very different idea now as to what a Christian is. And in fact, think about this. Things go on now in church that 50 years ago would have never even been thought of. Not only in church, but all of our so-called Christians. And I'm talking about this morning, we're going to talk about hypocrisy. I did look up the definition, just so I can read it here. Hypocrisy. A simulation, a pretending to be what one is not. A dissimulation, a concealment of one's real character and motives. I'm afraid we have a lot of hypocrites who are professing to be Christians today. It's a picture of the old, what was it, the old Roman theater where they would put a mask on to hide who they were. I'm afraid we are wearing masks today. Not, not from the coronavirus. We're wearing masks in the fact that we come into church and we grin and we smile and we say good morning, but it's not in our hearts. What's on our face is not what's in our heart. <clears throat> we want to talk about hypocrisy in our churches today. So if you have your Bible, I want to read a couple of verses in chapter... 4 of Acts, starting 36 verse, and, and Hosus, who by the apostles were surnamed Barnabas, who is being interpreted the son of consolation of Levite and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Going on to chapter 5. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. Great fear came upon all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. Peter answered unto her, 
Tell whether you sold the lamb for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold the feet of them which have buried thy husband at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Let this word not return void. Let it touch our hearts, Lord, in a way that will make us see that, Lord, we should be true in our hearts, true in our beliefs, and live our lives the way that we are supposed to as Christians in a day-to-day situation. Thank you, Lord, for those that have come out. Let this word not return void. Lift us up and forgive us for our sins and failures. In Christ's name we ask it all. Amen and amen. I don't know about you, but in this church, I know one thing I wouldn't have wanted to be, and I wouldn't have wanted to be an usher. Amen? <laughs> Boy, they had some duties, didn't they? Uh, I mean, when they drop dead, you got to take them out and, and, and bury them there in the service. Wow. I'm telling you, I, I, I would make sure that I was not elected as a usher in that church. In this ch- church that we're talking about this morning, the church is just experiencing one great revival. Man, I'm telling you, the, they were on fire. They, they were getting excited. Things were happening. People were getting saved. There was all kinds of people getting saved. Thousands of them, in fact, were getting saved. And can I tell you this? The devil didn't like it. Boy, the devil doesn't like it. When things get, get going good in church, I can tell you this, the devil does not like it. And he will do anything that he can to destroy that testimony, to destroy what God has done. He'll try to, he tried to stop this church by intimidation. He tried to uh, do it by persecution. But when he couldn't stop it from, from without, guess what? He started working from within. He couldn't conquer the church, but maybe he could corrupt the church. And people, I'm telling you, we're living in a society today where the church has been corrupted. We are preaching and teaching things that are, that are, not, that are not what God said we should be teaching. We are, we are watering down the Word of God. We are taking away things that, that we, we did offend. We're afraid we'll offend someone. So we take it out. Or we overlook it. Or we just go by it. It's a smorgasbord this morning. We're taking out what we want and doing what we do. You remember Benjamin Franklin. Uh, Benjamin Franklin had the, what they call the Franklin Bible. Do you know why they called it that? Benjamin Franklin, he did not believe in the resurrection. So he went through and he took the Word of God and everywhere that it referred to the resurrection of man, he simply cut it out. And then he published a Bible with those verses not in there. And they called it the Franklin Bible. I'm afraid that's what we're doing today. The parts that we don't like, the parts that's calling sin, sin, we don't like. We're taking them out of it. We like that part where Jesus says, I love you. Everybody loves that. But when He says, I am also your judge. And that sin you're committing is not right. We don't like that. I like this way. If you look at chapter 5 there, what's the first word in chapter 5? But. (laughs) But. Man, we were just having a great revival. But. But what? But. Ananias and Sapphira. Wow. Wow. We have so many people today who are, are, are professed to be Christians and, and they're on fire for the Lord. But then we find out that, uh, that they're not. Uh, we find that all of these church members in this church were, were having, they had great generosity. We find that, that Barnabas there, he came and brought all of his uh, money and he laid it down at the, the apostles' feet. Man, it was great generosity going on. We find that there was uh, uh, unity. Everybody was happy. Everybody was shouting and praising the Lord. But Ananias and Sapphira. 
There's always a but in there. But look what happened. There was a problem, and the problem in this church, and it reminds me of the story of Joseph back in the Old Testament, the children of Israel. They had just conquered a, a mighty foe, and then they, they got to the pride, and boy, they went out against this little town called Ai. And this little town just sent them a running. I mean, it killed 36 of them. And, and jo, Joshua, he was, got down on his knees and he said, Lord, Lord, what happened? Why? We, this little bitty town and, 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 and we couldn't conquer it. What happened? And God answered him and said, there's sin in the camp. There's sin in the camp. Today's church, people, there's sin in the camp. There's sin. Today we allow things that 50 years ago we wouldn't allow. There's things going on in church now that we just accept. We don't even preach against them anymore. Uh, things like adultery and, and, and homosexuality, we don't, we're afraid to preach on them anymore. Afraid that somebody will get mad and leave. Well, brother, that ain't what God said. God said do it anyway. Amen. They need it. They may not like it, but they need it. Amen. These people, Ananias and Sapphira, they had of what we would call a premeditated sin. They, were, they intended to do what they did. And I'm telling you this, people, we have them today that live in their life the same way. In premeditated sin, they're planning to sin. They, when they leave here, they got it on their minds and in their hearts, they're planning to sin. I can tell you this. Phone ring at home at 8 o'clock in the morning. Door answer the phone. It's AutoZone calling. What do they want? they want? They want Brother Clifford to come to work. And she'll say what? She'll look at me and I'm going, Mm-mm. no other one. And she'll say, well, he's not available now. Amen? Did I lie? Yes, I lied. Amen? You know them. God hates a liar. Do you know that? All lying is wrong. But I can tell you this. This sin that Ananias and Sapphira was different. It was different. It wasn't spontaneous. They planned it. They planned to do this. Proverbs 29.1 says, He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck. Permit me, if you will, just a little bit of liberty this morning. I want you to use your imagination just a little bit this morning. Amen. Back up in the 36th verse there, in the 37th verse, we're talking about Barnabas. Boy, he made a good donation. Now, he didn't do it to, to flaunt the fact that he, he'd given money. He, that wasn't his thing. He, he, but the Word had got around that he'd give out a good thing. So, I can just see this couple sitting around thinking, well, why is he getting all the praise? Amen. We need some of that praise too, you know. So we'll give some money. Amen. So they do what? They go out and they, they sell this here, this land, and they get this big bag of money for it. And they bring it home and they dump it out on the kitchen table. And they get to look at that money. And I can tell you this the Bible says money's a trap. Amen. 1 Timothy 6 9 says, But they that that will be rich, fall in temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. They get to look at that money. <laughs> I've heard people say, man, if I had a million dollars, I'd start giving to the church. Can I tell you this? If they got a hundred dollars they don't give to it, they ain't going to if they got a million. Amen? Money doesn't tend to make Greedy people unselfish. You know what money tends to do? It tends to make them more greedy. Amen? The more you have, the more you want. So Ananias and Sapphira, they look at this pile of money here and they, they get to thinking about it. <clears throat> Boy, it's going to be a great day Sunday. We take this money to church and give it to them. Amen? But then they get to look and they get to thinking, you know something? Hmm. We, we're going to have to retire one of these days. Why, why don't we just take a little portion of this over here? We'll just put it over here for our retirement. 
And then, and then on top of that, uh, you know, the kids have got to go to school, got to pay for some education. Hey, I, we ain't had a vacation in a while, so let's just put a little over here for this vacation. And, and, and maybe we're needing a new camel, you know, hey man, who knows, you know, for transportation, whatever. By Sunday, half of it had got over here and half of it over there. So we take it down, take it down to the church, and they bring it in. They gave it to old Peter. What did they say? Man, we sold that land and look what we brought. We just brought it all to you. Knowing that that was a lie. Knowing that that was a lie in their heart. You see, the lie here is the fact that they had planned to lie. They had, and you know they had because they had made it up together what they were fixing to do. The story continues. Was it wrong, and I'll ask you in your heart this morning, was it wrong to only bring half the money that they had sold for the land? No. It wasn't wrong. It was not wrong. No, we're in here. There's no record of God telling them that they had to bring it all to begin with. And that's the point that Peter's trying to make in verse 4 there. Nothing was wrong with any of this. The problem was not their giving only part of the money. Their problem was they said they gave it all. They gave it all. They intentionally lied and deceived to lift who? To lift themselves up. To make themselves look good. They said we give it all to the church. In other words, they pretended to be somebody they were not. They were hypocrites. Hypocrisy. If they'd have come and said, hey, we sold the land for $50,000 and we're going to bring 25000 of it to you, man, everybody would have been shouting and praising God. But they didn't. They said, that's all we got and you get it all. You look at me and say, well, how does that apply to me, preacher? I can tell you this. We come to church and we'll sing songs like, All to Jesus I surrender. And then the first time it rains on Sunday, I can go today raining out there. I might get wet if I go over to church. Amen. Or they come to sweet hour of prayer. And then you know, you check them out and find out they hadn't prayed 10 minutes in the last month. Amen. But it's the truth, isn't it? The only time that they pray any kind of spiritual prayer is when they're doing it right here in church. Amen. When do they start praying at home? When do they start praying down at the auto zone? Amen. There's nothing wrong, nothing says you can't pray anytime. In fact, the Bible says you need to pray all the time. We have ushers, I'm talking about ushers. Ushers collect the offering. Man, they smile and hand pass the plate, but when it gets back there, they don't reach in their back pocket and put nothing in there. Amen. Now I'm not preaching on tithing people, okay? We're preaching on hypocrisy this morning. It's trying to be. Saying that you're something that you're really not. We'll teach our kids to sing, Oh, be careful, little eyes. And then go home and watch some of the dirtiest movies and stuff on TV that you've ever seen. Nora and I tried to watch a movie last night, and it's some of the filthiest language on that. It just, you can't find a good movie no more. Not really. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 8, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You can fool some of the people all the time. You can, feel, you can fool all the people some of the time. But you can't fool all the people all the time. Amen. Those in your home will figure it out. Can I tell you this? Those that are around you, you can, 
You can profess to be a Christian, but that your family is going to soon know whether you really are or not. Those that you work with will soon know how you act. Those your neighbors, those at church are soon going to find out whether you're truly a Christian or not. Proverbs 26, 26. Whose hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. Can I tell you this? You can't fool God anytime. Amen? You cannot fool God anytime. <coughs> Personal. When they're trying to do something that that they, they know that they're not supposed to be doing. What do they do? They, they look to the right. And then they look to the left. And they look to the front. And they look to the back. They just left one direction out. They need to be looking up. Because God is seeing what they're doing all the time. <clears throat> we say, <laughs> I know that old boy. I know he's a hypocrite. And we, we, we're quick to judge. We can point them out. We know who they are. But I can remember this. When you got one finger pointing, you got three pointing back at you. Amen? <clears throat> you know, Jesus was a kind and compassionate friend, wasn't He? Even when we mess up, He's kind and He's compassionate. Particularly to, to those that are saved. But to those that are hypocrites, that are not true Christian, that just profess to be and are not, He can very, be very harsh. You remember the woman caught in adultery? Jesus said unto her, I forgive you, go and sin no more. The woman at the well married five times, shacking up with another man. Jesus said, I give you living water. Zacchaeus, a liar and a thief. He said what? Today salvation shall come to your house. But how did he treat the religious hypocrites? Like a lion. He was no longer a lamb. He was a lion. You snakes. You generation of vipers. You're like a whitewashed tomb. You clean yourself up on the outside, but you're filthy inside. You build an online profile, but I know the truth about you. How many people have filled out a resume? And are you always honest on that resume? Now, I've worked in for many, many years in the secular world, and I found out that those words on that resume are not always true. They try to make themselves look good. That's the way people do as they're in their Christian walk. What did Jesus do to the hypocrites? He took a whip and drove them out of the temple, didn't He? He run them off, shouting at them and turning His house, for turning His house into a den of thieves. Can I tell you this? Being a hypocrite is a stench in God's nostrils. So we've seen there's hypocrisy in the church. There's a, the purging of the sin. <laughs> I want to ask this and, and don't throw things at me. Why did, why did Ananias' wife so far, why did she come three hours later? I guess it took her that long to get ready. Amen? <laughs> she couldn't get to church on time. Eh? But anyway, this don't go there. The Holy Spirit exposed, exposed what? The whole thing right in front of the church. It was a gift of knowledge that was whispered to Peter by the Holy Spirit. He's the only one that could have done it. The Holy Spirit had to have told Peter that they're lying. They're lying. So what was the source of sin here? You should have seen that. Verse 3 there, but Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart? Satan is the source of all this. Satan is the source of all lies. How many of you ever come to church and, and you know these people? They're sitting there and they're thinking, they'll look around and say, oh, I know that guy's over there talking about me. 
Or I know, I know, I know that person don't like me. I just know they don't like me. Or I know that guy's against me about everything I do. And you know what? When they find out the truth, it couldn't have been any further than the truth. What is that? Satan puts us in your mind, gets us to thinking, well, that guy looked at me wrong, so he must hate me. Amen. We always go around trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. The Holy Spirit had revealed to, to Peter the source of the sin. There is also, I want to, to grasp the seriousness of this sin. It was a serious sin, wasn't it? Any lie is serious, and we never, we are never more like Satan than when we lie. Because he is the father of lies. It's more serious, we know, to lie before a judge. You go to court, and you lie in court. What do they call it? Perjury? Isn't it? Perjury? I believe that's I've watched Perry Mason. Perjury. And what do they? They can put you in jail for that. If you lie in court, they can put you in jail. Guess what? It's even more serious to lie to God. Amen? More serious. And I'll ask this question this morning. Have you ever lied to God? Think about it. Be careful. Have you ever lied to God? I'd say it. 99.9% of us have lied to God at one time or the other. Have you ever made a promise to God and then didn't keep it? I've got a whole string of them, list of them down here, God. And I, I, I'll do this and I'll do that. And it never got done. Promised Him I'd do them. Maybe we're sitting in church this morning. Maybe you're just sitting here thinking, boy, I wish He'd shut up and get on out of here. Hey, Amen. Pretending church. Amen. That's what I call it. You know something? We need to quit worrying about what other people think about us and start thinking about what God thinks about us. What are you in the eyes of God this morning? So there come to be punishment for Ananias and Sapphira, didn't they? And boy, it was a severe punishment. They died. <laughs> Saved by grace does not mean that it gave you a license to sin. God judges all believers. Be sure, the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. We all reap what we sow. Every believer goes, undergoes three judgments. Three judgments as a sinner, as a servant, and as a son. If you've been saved, your judgment as a sinner was in the past. Jesus did that at Calvary. If you're a servant, it will be in the future. One day, we will stand before an Almighty God and we will receive rewards for what we've done now. But then, as a son, you are being judged right now. Right now. You say, I'm a son of, of God? You are being judged on that sonship right now. In the past, a sinner was judged at the cross. You died with Christ. God's wrath toward your sin was poured out on Christ at Calvary. Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Sin was fully judged there. I want you to picture this. You're out in a prairie and there's a big fire goes through. Where is the safest place for you to be right now? Where it was burnt. Huh? Where the fire was at. That's where it needed to be, isn't it? Well, let me tell you. Well, that's the safest place now to be is at the feet of Jesus Christ. Because all our sins were covered right there. And that's where we need to be standing right now. We don't need to be out in the world trying to, trying to evade that. We need to be under the blood of Christ. In the future, you're judged as a servant. One of these days, you'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And this is not the great white throne. You're going to have a one-on-one -on -one personal interview 
with Jesus Christ. You know, and that's what I always say to people. What are you going to tell him? What are you going to say to Christ? What have you got to say to him? What? What are you carrying with you? You're going to have to tell him what your motives were. He knows what they were. But you're going to have to stand before him. It's a time of rewards. And I've heard people say, well, you don't work for rewards. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. That's what he's put us here for. If it hadn't been, he wouldn't have said in Matthew 6, 20, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through to dirt nor steal. It also said in 1 Corinthians 3rd chapter, it talks about all these things that are wood, hay, and stubble are going to be burned up. But all those things you did for Christ are going to be like precious stones in the eyes of God. If any man's work abide, which he got built upon, he shall receive a reward. 1 Corinthians 3.14 But in the present, you're being judged right now as a son. Right now. In Hebrews 12.6, it talks about chastisement. <laughs> How many has been chastised by the Lord? I don't know about you, I have. I didn't like it. I, I'll give you my summation of it. I didn't like it. Amen? But I can tell you this. It was necessary. It's necessary to get me in line again. I didn't like it when mom whooped me on the... You know what? But it was necessary. It needed to happen to straighten me out. It had to happen. God has to do the same thing to us sometimes. You know, Ananias and Sapphira were saved. And they were being judged as sons. So they died because they crossed the line with God. This is not pleasant. And I'm not, I didn't look forward to sharing this. But God sometimes takes a believer home early because of sin. I do believe in the sin and the death. Now, you may disagree with me, but I, I do. You remember over in the 11th chapter, 1 Corinthians, talking about there were people that were abusing the Lord's Supper. In the 29th verse there, it said, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Also in... The 30th verse there, it says, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Why? Just for taking of the Lord's Supper incorrectly. Or in, out, of, uh, 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 out of disrespect for God. In 1 Corinthians 5.1 it says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And you're puffed up and have not rather mourn that he that had done this deed might be taken away from among you. Sinning before God is a serious thing. And in this world today, we just, we just take it very lightly anymore. Nobody seems to worry about God. Nobody looks up anymore. To see God. And to worry about what He thinks about it. Oh, we worry about our neighbors and we worry about our family, but we don't worry about God. You know, the word destruction doesn't always mean annihilation. Sometimes it does, though. 1 John 5.16 If any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, that implies what? There is a sin unto death, right? He shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. It's a judgment. It's also, it is a saving judgment. For Ananias and Sapphira, what? He saved them out of this wicked world. He just kept them from sinning anymore, didn't he? 
Think about that one. When is that sin going to be your last one? When is that sin that you commit that God takes you home to keep you from sinning anymore? Suppose you've got a three-year-old boy and you look out the window and he's out there and you see him out heading out in the street and plays in the street. What do you do? You go out and say, son, don't play in the street. You know, come back in here. So you give him a second chance, right? You go back in, look out, and you see him heading for the street again. What do you do this time? Now you punish him, right? So you let him go again. And he heads the next time, what do you do? You grab him up, and you don't let him outside anymore, right? And that's what God, that's how God handles this, this sin. After a while, you keep doing it, and He ain't going to let you do it anymore. He's going to take you home, so you will not be doing it anymore. <clears throat> of course, you look at me and say, well, going home to heaven, that's, that's not real bad punishment, amen? Amen. I don't know about you. I don't want to get benched early. Amen. I want to, I want to stay around a little while. Amen. It's a saving judgment. It's a saving judgment for Ananias and Sapphira. It's a saving judgment for the church. 511 there. God did this what? If you look at that 11th verse there in chapter 5, God did it for the church. <laughs> don't you know that church set up and took notice? <laughs> Amen. If the ushers have them carry out dead bodies, hey, I'm telling you, just because they lied, they took notice, didn't they? Maybe we should get scared a little more. Amen? As a church, maybe we should. Jude 1.7 says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example serving, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Sodom and Gomorrah was an example for people to see. Can San Francisco be far behind them? Huh? He lets them go. He doesn't, he doesn't, how would you say, destroy every one of them. But I can tell you this. He gave us an example. Sodom and Gomorrah is an example that we all need to go by. So in conclusion this morning, it's a judgment that can save souls. We need that. We need that judgment. Purity brings power. So this morning, speaking about hypocrisy, sin in the life of a Christian is more serious than sin for someone who is lost. Do you think of that? It's more serious on you. For you've been what? You've been bought with a price and you're judged as a son today. You are a child of God. So be very careful not to lie to God. Be very careful. I, I've, I've caught myself saying... Lord, if you'll do this, and then I'll go, hold on a minute, Lord. I, I know I can't keep that. Amen? I've had to say that. I, I, I want to, Lord. And, and I'll try, and I'll strive. But I, if I fail, you know me. Amen? And I'm not going to commit. I don't want to lie to you. I don't want to lie to God. I don't, want, I don't want Him to think that I'd lie to Him. Guard against hypocrisy in your own life. You need to be the same at home as you are at church. You need to be in the same in a closet as you are standing up in front of a Sunday school class. Your walk talks and your talk talks. But your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Everybody stand if you would. But I want to say this in closing. I've heard people say, I don't want to go down there because I know 
oh, so-and-so, and I know he's a hypocrite. Do not let a hypocrite keep you out of church. Because you know something? These hypocrites down at Walmart and down at the Piggly Wiggly, these, these hypocrites down there too. And we keep going to them, don't we? I assure you, they're full of them too. There's one person in this church that will never disappoint you. And don't look at me, because it's not me. It's Jesus Christ. Janet.